Okay, uh, good evening. Welcome to the latest version of Building the Scottish State with myself, uh, Dr. Mark McNaught, uh, here on the 27th of uh, January 2022. And I have the great pleasure of having with me again, uh, MP Alba MP Kenny McCaskill uh, with us this evening. And so first of all, uh, Kenny, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, pleasure to be back. Okay, so uh, there's, well, what can we talk about, huh? Well, let, let's let's start with, um, the issue of the uh, of the wind farm uh, sell off and and we and apparently as I understand it but you can correct me if I'm wrong uh, the, the, the the there was a one off payment to I guess to the Scottish government of 700 million for uh, offshore wind rights uh, and given that there's uh, Scotland is about five million five hundred thousand population that works to 127 pounds per person or 281 pounds per household uh, and um, and given that the fuel costs will be uh, will be increasing greatly, that means the wind payout is worth in total 49 days worth of fuel cost, seven weeks, well under the two months cost and 13 uh, percent of one year's full cost. So for the average Scot. So it doesn't sound like it was a really good deal. Well, it wasn't a good deal. You know, we expected the British to sell us out in oil and gas. I think we were entitled to and have a, the Scottish government has a duty to do better on offshore wind. Uh, and what we've seen is a hype about this great boon feast has come and we'll be benefiting from a supply chain. And the fact of the matter is they've sold out for far too little. They've failed to take an appropriate stake and we're not yet prepared, as far as I can see, to benefit significantly from the supply chain. Uh, so it's not a good deal for Scotland and the trumpeting by the SNP is frankly trying to put uh, you know, lipstick on a pig as the, <laughs> the saying goes. This is an all round poor show by them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what do you, why do you think that is? I mean, is do you think there's kind of a lack of expertise in the Scottish government with these types of issues? Or what do you, why do you think they, there was, it, it, there was such a bad deal? Was it, I mean, cause, uh, and also what, uh, effect does the Scottish government had over it? Isn't it more of a Westminster issue or um, if you could explain it to us a little bit about, you know, kind well, of the functioning uh, of that. Some of the things I can't answer because they have to speak for themselves. I think there is a spectacular level of incompetency. Uh, is there the, the, a lack of skills within, you know, some, whether it's the Scottish government or indeed whether it's within the civil service? Probably yes, but I think first and foremost, the lack of vision. People such as Commonweal for years and indeed the SNP used to articulate and champion a Scottish energy company. They've rightly set up a Scottish national investment bank but haven't utilised it in any way to even acquire a share uh, when you're giving out uh, public assets even if you don't take a stake through your own company you can ask for a share from the company so they could have done so much I remember back in 2014 and indeed the years before when we were preparing for uh, uh, the uh, independence referendum and the white paper was being set up. We didn't have expertise within the Scottish government on defence policy. And I recall what we did was we outsourced it to the Brookings Institute in, uh, in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. to provide some advice about Scottish defence policy. It wouldn't have been that hard to go on to the government of Norway, either hire somebody from them or get somebody on secondment, you know, go to the public sector. There are brains out there and it seems to me what's happened is that Scottish government and Scottish agencies have been taken to the cleaners. They've been bought and sold by corporate gold who have hoodwinked them and said how well they're doing when in fact when you analyse it we realise that we're not doing particularly well at all. We've released far too much, far too soon for far too little. Uh, it really is a sad state of affairs and the suggestion that there's a supply chain there just waiting for a boom feast I actually chaired a conference online on the uh, on Tuesday of this week that was about the supply chain in the renewable sector. And the first speaker actually is a co-chair of the UK energy uh, renewable energy supply chain. And he put up a graph that showed where the supply chain company existed. And to be fair, most was oil and gas related. The bulk of it was in England, some of it was in Scotland, none of it was in my own constituency of East Lothian, and yet that's where a lot of the offshore wind is going to come. I okay. can't think of one company in East Lothian that is sent to benefit from this supply chain boom feast that we've been told about. They just don't exist. They're just not ready. We're not going to get any benefit for the turbines because that's actually what this UK energy supply chain said. He said, we're not getting any of the turbines. Uh, they'll go elsewhere, but they wanted some of their supply chain. But most of that will probably go south of the border. 
And when you say supply chain, do you mean supply of energy or supply chain to fabricate the uh, the uh, the the you know the the wind the wind farms or well, there's all sorts of work that goes with it. I mean, I saw the Scottish government were and others were bragging, if you can put it that way, about the benefits coming to Leith. There's going to be assembly work at Leith. Turbines that are constructed elsewhere will be sailed around the coast of the UK or perhaps even across the Seven Seas will be brought to Leith where they will be put together and then floated out to the North Sea. Now, I don't scorn those jobs. They'll be welcome. I was born in Leith. But let's be clear. The real profit is going to those who manufacture them, whether in England, whether in the Netherlands or whether in Indonesia. What we're getting in Scotland is low-skilled, low-value jobs, constructing a model kit and putting it together and sending it out. But even in that, we're not guaranteed the supply chain jobs. I was up in Aberdeen a few backs meeting with Jake Malloy from the RMT union. And he was telling me that some of the sites that are already providing, not just for the oil and gas, but for the renewable sector, what we're seeing is it's low-waged foreign labour that's coming in. Our own people aren't getting it. And he gave me an example of, I think it was Bucky, where they are servicing uh, offshore wind turbines that are off the Murray Firth. That's not staffed by people from the northeast of Scotland, let alone money. It's low-wage East European labour that's come in uh, to working for rates that others are not prepared to work for. So when the Scottish government say we're going to ensure that we benefit from the supply chain jobs, we're not benefiting at the present moment. I can't think of one supply chain job working in East Lothian at the moment when what we're seeing in the northeast of Scotland is the work going elsewhere or abroad. You know, I hope we'll get something. But the Scottish government's going to have to up their game because they're selling us out big time at the present moment. Mm -hmm. And and you mentioned that you you know if you were if you were to if you were in charge of it you would do it differently you would get you know uh, real expertise to come in from you know people who uh, uh, know what they're talking about. Uh, any, any government, it's not just you know any government abroad. The Norwegians just wouldn't do this. The Norwegians must think we button up the back. I mean you know the Irish wouldn't do it. They don't get. The benefits that we have from our natural bounty. They never got oil and gas. They're not getting the same offshore wind that we have. There's just no way that they would have passed this by. And yet mm -hmm. we are doing it again. And as the old saying goes, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me what twice, shame on me. We knew that the UK was going to fool us. We didn't expect the Scottish government would sell us out. Yeah. And could I mean, and could this what how could the Scottish government have done something differently if if Westminster has, you know, I mean, you know, of the, you know, the crown of states, you know, control of the of, of the area around it? Um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, 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 I take what you say in terms of the expertise, but I mean, well, would, well, let me run through the answers for you. One, you could have asked for far more because actually England got far more for you know, delivering far less. We got something like 5% of the value of what they got. So they sold it at a, a knockdown price. They have released, you know, they didn't give a Scottish state company any say. Fine. They didn't establish one. They didn't take a stake. You know, at the end of the day, you could offset and you could say to a company, you know, they might bulk it, the idea that you would take 49% or even 51%, but they might allow you to take 5% or 10%. They didn't even ask. But even moving aside from that, they didn't give any Scottish companies a say. This has all gone to huge multinationals from abroad. There are Scottish companies, not as big as the multinationals, but they didn't get a sniff of it. You would have thought you might at least have got a Scottish company to have had a share. And we have the absurdity, you know, we have the, had the absurdity of the Dutch state railway company running our railways. We've now got the absurdity of Vattenfall, who are the Swedish state energy company having a share in their offshore wind. And yet there isn't a Scottish state energy company. So you didn't need to release all that. You could ensure that all, uh, you, you could have also made sure that you tied in with uh, the oil and gas that has to be decommissioned or operating. They didn't do that. They could have, you know, uh, done other things such as specifying the contracts because they haven't told us. They've said we're going to benefit from the supply chain. How? No. I know from East Lothian that what happens is the work comes here and you see it in construction all the time. The work comes in, it goes to bigger companies from, you know, the, the McAlpines or whatever. They get the contract, they spill it down. The contracts don't come to local firms in East Lothian. They don't go to big Scottish companies. You know, the work goes to the first, you know, preferred tender or the lowest tender, which quite often isn't a Scottish company. So they haven't guaranteed that. If I'm wrong on that, 
then let Kate Forbes or somebody else come forward and say, we've earmarked that these contracts will come to Scotland, that Scottish contracts will come here and that the work will be Scottish labour. Not as Jake Malloy tells me, that we have now folk operating in the North Sea who aren't Scottish or even UK nationals. They're not doing three weeks on, one week off. They're doing years on, if not months, and they're, you know, Southeast Asian labour. Uh, so we're being taken to the cleaners and we're not protecting our own people and our own businesses. Mm -hmm. And once uh, and uh, once independent uh, Scotland does become independent, hopefully in the in the, in the very near future, uh, how would Scotland take control of the renewables? I mean, you know, how could it be clawed back or I mean, do you, how, how do you see that playing out, assuming oh. that? There's still much more to go out. I mean, at the end of the day, I think you have to establish a Scottish state energy company. That's been argued, you know, by Commonweal, by Robin McAlpine, by George Kervin, all of whom know much more than I do on this. You know, but establishing of a state company, making sure that the state takes a stake through that company and protects the interests of the Scottish people. You know, so what hasn't already been sold off, you know, should be protected. You have to make sure that the contracts specify that it will, business will cascade down to Scottish work here, that they won't offshore the work, that they will actually meet, you know, rates of pay that we expect our people to have. All of these things, you know, are done. There's what, you know, there's what countries like Norway do as a matter of course. We've had the opportunity to look. It's not rocket science. You know, mm -hmm. just send a senior Scottish government team of civil servants across to Norway, let them work with stat oil or whatever else, and, you know, learn the lessons and then come back here. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, uh, could these, uh, another question from Mike Fennick. Uh, could the Scottish National Investment Bank have taken an interest, even if small, so that it was an example of a, Sc a Scottish sovereign wealth fund? I, I'm not a, a banker, so I can't ask you any second uh, certainty. But I can't see how, you know, when you control an asset like that, and these big multinationals want it. You know, if you ask for something outrageous, then you won't get it. But if you ask for something modest, then you will get it. So it seems to me that, yes, that was the whole purpose of the Scottish National Investment Bank. They must have been able to do that. There are funds and resources available in the world if you want to get it. And it's exactly the same as the failure to deliver, you know, for BIFAB or Arnish. All you have to do is to have a wee word in some of these people's ears to say that we expect contracts to come here, not to go to Indonesia. You can't say that every turbine will be constructed here but if you make a request for some then I think you'll get it because they don't want to alienate the Scottish government and instead what we had was a Scottish government saying energy is reserved there's nothing we can do well you control planning all you have to do is say if you don't if you don't give some contracts to buy fiber harness you're not getting planning consent move yeah. on yeah. you know so you know, these things have to be negotiated. Would we get absolutely everything we want? Of course we wouldn't. Are we in the same position as the Norwegians? Probably not. But should we be able to get much more than we've actually received? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to uh, shift now to the uh, the issue of the uh, the ferry service to uh, to uh, Europe. And I saw uh, in, in some news articles that you and Neil uh, had been, um, you know, had been uh, were able to see a, a senior minister about that. So could you tell us about the you know, kind of what happened, uh, what happened and what, what the what the context is for the. Uh, well, to, I mean, to be fair to, to, to be fair to the, the UK minister, he's a very affable gentleman, but, you know, he's a Scottish office, not uh, Department of Transport. But, you know, in reality, the bulk of transport policy is devolved. The control over the ferries is dependent upon the Scottish government. The impediments that previously existed about EU directives no longer apply. Uh, so first and foremost, you know, the responsibility here rests with the Scottish government. The problem is the Scottish government have accepted the formal position of the UK government, which is that, you know, you can have a ferry service. It would be a really good thing to have, but it has to be market driven. Now, nobody says, Mark, you know, we want to have a, a, a haulage company, but you better build the road network. You provide the road network. Mm -hmm. Nobody says start a railway company and they expect the state to provide the rail network. Why then should we not provide some modest seed corn funding as to say it would be a good thing, but a private investor has to do it. We already subsidise ferry services in Scotland. I think it's £120 million per annum. Alf knows better than me. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Baird's the expert in this to keep Carl Mack, you know, going in internal policies. So 
first and foremost, what you simply need to do is to get CalMac to operate a ferry service. The easiest way would to do what uh, most normal countries would do, which is to say we want to run a ferry service from Rosyth, say, to uh, Zeebrugge or Antwerp. What subsidy would you require to get it going? Because it does have to be commercially driven. You know, sure. somebody said we want to have a Scottish service from Rosyth to, uh, I don't know where, I'm trying to think, you know, uh, you know, Christian Sund or something like that in Norway. They might struggle because there is a limited market to go to the Scandinavian nations, despite the desire I think there is for it. It's hard. But going to the low countries is a no-brainer, especially when you see the channel ports backed up with lorries, many of which from Scotland, and all of which are probably carrying perishable items, whether fresh fish or, or food from my East-Lothian constituency. So you just put that out, you know, whether to Cal Mac, which would be the simplest way, and Neil and I have suggested that, just go and do it, or you get a tender out there. This wouldn't be tens of millions. What you're looking at is a modest fraction of what we already pay to provide for that. And it would be, you know, vital for Scottish the economy. The discussions we had with the Euro, with the UK minister were on funding that might be available from a, a transition scheme that the UK is bringing in because we are going to have to get, you know, cleaner fuel. There has to be cleaner fuel because marine diesel is currently very dirty uh, mm. and that has to be improved although uh, Alf again kindly sent me something about how Norway's bringing in hydrogen that we've currently got these crazy ferries and uh, being constructed in uh, Port Glasgow that are LNG which is a daft system to be going on uh, for this so what's, what's LNG briefly I, I, well, I, liquid natural gas okay. Uh, okay. You know, it's much better to either have battery or hydrogen, and that's probably the, the foreseeable future, and that's where we should be going. But the current thing is there are companies, you know, it's like a train. I'm going down to London next week. LNER don't own the train. They, they hire the train from, you know, some big merchant bank or investors who own trains, and they use it. And that's what you do. You get CalMac or some other person, DFDS or any other ferry company, as was super fast, to say, this is the ferry service we want. This is the number of times it must go. This is the standard it must comply with. All of these things. How much do you need us to give you some support? We do that in you know, aviation. That's what Jack McConnell rightly did to try and get direct air links from Scotland. We gave money that was massaged through as basically being for advertising or whatever. But it was a subsidy to help promote the link to say fly directly to Scotland from places in Scandinavia or whatever. And that's all we have to do. That's what... It's what the Flemish government do. They provide some seed corn money to try and get a route going. They've got money, and I think so Douglas Chapman has told me, and he's probably right. They've got yeah. money available to help get a route from Antwerp or Zeebrugge to Scotland. Maybe if the Scottish government matched it, we would actually get that route up and going. But mm -hmm. the Scottish government at the present moment say it would be a good thing to have, but it's got to fund itself. Well, we yeah. don't expect that in the railways. We don't expect it on haulage, and we shouldn't expect it in ferries and they should get their hands in their pockets to a small amount and get a ferry going mm -hmm. yeah okay and uh let's see um uh going uh, before we move on to the judiciary the uh, let's see uh, uh could scotland afford ownership of all renewables i mean in my view they would make such I don't a think, huge I don't, think we, I don't think we could manage ownership of all renewables i'm more than happy to share it with some private comes i just think we should be taking a stake <laughs> ownership of some are stake and others. So, you know, we don't need to ask nationalize everything. You know, mm -hmm. Norway doesn't own every, you know, every oil field or gas field in Norway. Star oil has some. So I think, you know, would we want to? Probably we just couldn't cope, but we certainly have to have some. And, you know, we're just not, and we have to regulate and get our fair share and income from the others. So I think it's about a matter of balance. At the present moment, we've just handed it over to big business as the UK government's handed oil and gas over to big business. And uh, as I saw Andy Whiteman in a tweet about, you know, the Cheviot stag in the black, black oil. Those of us my age will remember to, you know, remember the Cheviot the stag in the black, black oil about how they... Uh, sorry, could you, could you explain Stagen? I, I, I don't understand it, the reference. It was a play from the 784 Theatre Company okay. about how Scotland had been, when oil had first been discovered, how they had come and they, uh, the American companies were going to rip us off, and they did. We just didn't, didn't expect it to be repeated with offshore wind. So Andy was being uh, droll and facetious, but yeah. he was making a point, you know, because this is a rip-off once again. 
Okay. All right. I, I'd like to turn the discussion now to uh, the uh, the judiciary. And uh, given that you were a ju justice minister uh, in the Scottish government, and there was recently the hold on the legal services regulate uh, regulation reform, uh, which was issued, I believe, well, uh, issued by the Scottish government, which has been roundly condemned. I, I haven't looked into it in any detail, but I saw a, a, a tweet thread by Amr Anwar that was very critical of the, uh, and apparently they've pretty much got unanimity of uh, of the judiciary against the reforms. And I'm not sure exactly what they are. I read just a, a skimmed it just a bit, something about competition in the uh, in the uh, legal services profession. But uh, first of all, what can you, you know, based on your experience, what can you tell us about the proposed reforms, the reaction to them? And uh, yeah, well, I think the proposed reforms are unnecessary and what the Scottish Government, through the Robertson Review, is currently suggesting is extremely damaging to the separation of powers. We've already got an existing problems in Scotland because we have a Lord Advocate who is both, uh, it's now a she, uh, as opposed to a predecessor he, but we have a Lord Advocate who is both the senior legal advisor of the Scottish Government and indeed the head of the prosecution service. You know, we're now eight months into an SNP administration and they're not doing very much very quickly. That has to change. But the proposal uh, that has the judiciary uh, quite rightly speaking out and every judge, man and woman, has opposed this is moving away. And it came in from a suggestion, I'm told, by the Competition and Markets Authority, a UK-based matter. Equally, courts aren't simply, you know, there uh, for the free market. They are to be regulated. I think, you know, the best thing uh, is actually to leave the ultimate control of the courts under the Lord President, our most senior judge. His big objection is that this would see control of the courts as such, and indeed lawyers work, or lawyers working within it, would be subject to a body that would be appointed by the Scottish Parliament, which would ultimately be controlled by the Scottish Government, given it's a majority government. Mm -hmm. That's where he's worried. Now, I share those concerns because I was a lawyer for 20 years before I entered into politics. If I had issues with a client who wanted me to do this or do that, and I felt it was becoming ethically unacceptable, you simply had to point out that you were an officer of court. I was an officer of court, Mark. I can't do that. My obligation is to, you know not to tell lies, and I won't do that on your behalf. If you tell me that you're guilty, but you're not pleading guilty, you know, I can't act for you. If you tell me, you know, get stuck in there, you know, give them a hard time, unless I think that's appropriate and fair and balanced, I'm not doing it because I'm an officer of court. My word is therefore taken by sheriffs, and that's how it is. You ex and, and you uh, abide by the ruling set down by the court. That, I think, is correct, because lawyers have to act independently. We have to have judiciary that's separate from, you know, the uh, legislator that is separate from the executive. If you then have lawyers who are ultimately directed by the government, then I think, you know, it's bad enough having the prosecution service that's controlled by the government. It becomes a problem. So, you know, we should leave it alone. I have arguments with the judiciary. We have problems in the Scottish justice that we require to resolve. But I think the judicial system has to be kept separate. The laws are created by parliament. The laws are decided and brought in by government. But the interpretation of them, the actions within it, have to be done by people who are independent of government, who aren't beholden to government. And whether that's the Lord President or whether it was me when I first entered into a court, I'm an officer of court. I'm not there to accept the directions of the Scottish Government and to do what they say. I'm here to adhere to principles that are set down by the independent judiciary, uh, and that's ultimately by the Lord President. So although I never appeared before the Lord President, I did appear before sheriffs and sheriff principals, and they would have held me to account, but I had an, inter an ethos that I think, you know, Anwar Anbar and all lawyers will abide by, that officers of court, you abide by those things, and this would have political interference within a judicial system that has to be one of the separate, you know, prongs of keeping the, the you know, our judicial system separate from our executive and from our parliament. Okay, I'm I'm very much a you know I've, I've focused on the United States judiciary for a long time. I've done you know I did my thesis partly on it. I've I've, I've done you know a lot of work on that, and I think I have a pretty good understanding of the American system. But uh, and I'm going a little off on a tangent here. That uh, but but can, can laws, uh, as I understand it, in the British system or the UK system, laws cannot be declared unconstitutional. 
uh, they, the, 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 the Supreme Court or the law, law lords or whatever can rule on the way that a law is applied, but they can't rule a law, overturn a law because of its unconstitutionality, in part because there isn't a UK written constitution. Uh, can you speak a little to that just so I understand a little bit better? Don't have a written constitution. What the courts can do is describe that a law is, you know, uh, unacceptable. It doesn't meet. Uh, but they're there to interpret the law as such. Mm. You know, there, there is good reason why we should have a written constitution in Scotland and indeed in the United Kingdom. There's good reason why you should also have a constitutional court, although that would usually just be a specialist part of the court that you have, as indeed yeah. you have in the USA or elsewhere. In, uh, in, 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 sorry, just quickly, in, in France, you have the Cour Constitutionnelle, the, uh, the Conseil Constitutionnelle, and when there is a law being passed, it has to go through the Conseil Constitutionnelle to make sure that it abides by the constitution before it gets passed. So, you know, the, 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 that's, that's true. But since we're digressing, I've also digressed to say the most impressive people I have ever met were the South African post-apartheid constitutional court. They were, to a man and woman, phenomenal. They included the great Albie Sachs. They included, I thought, I think her name was Nancy O'Regan, who had been the Labour leader. They were... Uh, they were remarkable people and who must have been uh, uh, victims of oppression, some severely, such as uh, Albie Sachs. But uh, no, uh, we might not be able to replicate them, but we do have good people in Scotland. And Absolutely. I have my issues with the, with the judiciary, with the bar, and with lawyers. I've, I've, I've uh, put pins in my effigy over the years when I was Justice Secretary. <laughs> but, well, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's their right and entitlement. But, you know... The courts are there to be able to say that the government has interpreted things wrong, that the law goes beyond what they had the powers that they possessed to do. So they're there to provide an acceptance and you have to live with that. I mean, I had decisions taken by the courts in Scotland and indeed the Supreme Court that I did not like, but I had to live with them. Sometimes it required emergency legislation when we had the Saldus case that required you know, significant, massive changes to our criminal justice system and how we dealt with uh, the interview of prisoners. W so was we, that the Lockerbie bombing thing? No, that no. Saldus no, case. If, 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 just case, explain very briefly what the Saldus that. case was where you know, police previously used to be able to... Uh, take you to the station for a wee word mark or whatever. Uh, and we lawyered up. There's things about it. I, in some ways, I regret about it. But we had to bring in uh, clearer directions about when the police could interview, how they could interview, what would happen. That required us to basically change significantly and to do so almost overnight. But it was done. Uh, you know, we had to accept it. I know the Scottish so ch changing the law, basically. Uh, uh, changing the law. The whole, the whole way of how police carried out interviews had to change, mm -hmm. and it changed. Yeah, that, okay. We accepted that. Saldu's case, I, I disagreed with it. It was a case from Turkey that went through European courts that related to terrorism, and it resulted in people facing charges for shoplifting have to be dealt with in a way, but we had to do it, and, you know, uh, we just simply accept that and you get on and do it. Yeah, so cr so criminal procedure in in Scotland is 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 essentially governed by the uh, by by law. Uh, and well, that's, that's, this was this came in from Europe, and we required to accept it. And when criminal procedure wasn't operating in terms of you know appropriate human rights, then we required to address it, and address it we did. It was emergency legislation. It literally was brought in with officers based in a matter of weeks. Yeah. And I was uh, I, I also wanted to ask you about your view on um, uh, w with regard to the uh, both the Alex Salmon and Craig Murray cases and not to like, you know, name name anybody. But what are the flaws that you saw in that, uh, you know, legal dysfunctioning that you saw in that myself? Uh, my view, I you know, I saw that, you know, you had this change in policy uh, uh, within the Scottish government over, you know, the, the revelation of people's names, you know, the alphabet women's uh, women, so to speak. Uh, and that was a, that was a, that was a diversion from the the um, the, the law that you the, the Equalities Act that I, I'm, I'm assuming you had a part in, in producing. But it, it didn't seem to me as if it was based on law. It seemed to be as if this change in policy, they were legally they were prosecuting someone for a change in policy that was not reflected in law. Is that an accurate 
assessment? Well, of I think it's manifold. I mean, the, you know, uh, the Alex Salmon case and Craig Murray case are related because of Craig Murray reporting upon, you know, the Alex Salmon case. But the, you know, faults and in instances and in behaviour was separate in many uh, ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Scottish government's faults and failures in uh, the uh, uh, Alex Salmon case, you know, are numerous from, you know, the initial uh, catastrophic civil case that saw the Scottish government have to pay out uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds and that should have seen the permanent second secretary retire rather than have a contract extended yeah. through to a criminal prosecution that is unprecedented, you know, in recent history in Scotland and certainly in any of my experience in law now in excess of 40 years. Uh, you know, but the real abuse in Alex Salmon case also followed thereafter with the uh, restrictions on the... Uh, <laughs> protection of individuals and names and things such as that. I mean, that law came in, you know, it came in, I think, when I was... In, what was, was it? A, oh, sorry, the, 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 the law, was, I mean... It was, meant, it was meant to protect witnesses and, you know, organised crime-type cases. It must it reminds me, I must go away and investigate how many of these cases orders have been uh, imposed, because I think, frankly, very few. Uh, so, I mean, both cases have huge questions about the behaviour of uh, uh, institutions within Scotland, many of which, you know, come out badly, but, you know, it just reaffirms why it is imperative in every society, because I, you know, was trained in Scots law, I believe in the system, but we got things wrong, which mm -hmm. is why you have to, and I'm proud to have served on the Scottish government, but you have to have a separation of powers. In democracy, you have to separate, you know, you have to separate from the chief, you have to take <coughs> your legal advisor from the head of the prosecution service. It is a no-no. You have to make sure the state doesn't control the legal system. That should be the judiciary that are in charge. And so the Scottish government is taking us into territory that frankly, we shouldn't be there and they should be backing off fast. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you agree with uh, Joanna Cherry's MP's claim that the changing the court of session would be a breach of the Treaty of Union? Well, you know, the Treaty of Union was, you know, a deal done, uh, as I think the last time I was on your your uh, show suggested, it was a, the equivalent of a shotgun wedding. You know, if we hadn't signed it, then we were getting invaded. You know, those that signed it got rewarded handsomely because the people were against it and they signed it against the people's wishes. So yes, it is because, you know, Scots law, education and church were protected. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we're now part of the UK, so it's a breach of the Treaty of Union. But actually, you know, my one disagreement with this is it's not a legal battle. You know, our fight against the British state is driven politically and by our people. The idea that all we have to do is sit back, you know, crowdfund and QCs will save us from the day it ain't going to happen. So is it a breach of the Treaty of Union? Yes. Should they be going anywhere near it? No. You know, are they doing so? Absolutely. They're undermining us, but they've been doing that, you know, for 300 odd years. How do we get out of it? Well, I won't hold my breath for the court saving us from it, despite what I've been saying there about, you know, protecting the Scottish courts as an institution. We'll get out of it by political leadership and by our people saying that there's a better way of running our state and it's out with the UK. OK. And what um, why don't you think that, you know, uh, trying to prove in court that the Treaty of Union has been violated thus and Scotland having the because, for example, um, you know, even Margaret Thatcher said that the, that if there was a, a majority of Scottish MP of, of nationalist Scottish MPs elected, that they could withdraw uh, from the union. And if uh, yes, and that's, that's a political thing. You've just answered the point I made, Mark. Okay, you know, she has said it's a political matter. She has said if the Scots vote for it, the Scots can have it. All I'm saying is this idea that, oh, I've got here in my pocket, I have here a wonderful case, and I'm going to give it to Mr. or Mrs. X, who's going to go away now to the court of session, and in one leap, we are going to be free. I just don't believe it. We are now part of the UK Supreme Court system. You know, at the end of the day, UK Parliament will be accepted, as we've seen in recent decisions relating to decisions of the Scottish Parliament, that the UK is sovereign. Long before, you know, when I was still studying law, we had Lord Cooper who challenged, you know, the Treaty of Union and, you know, the sovereignty of the Scots. At the end of the day, is it worth pursuing some of these things in court? Yeah, it gives you, you know, another you know, another arrow to your bow. But at the end of the day, this is a political battle. It'll be mm -hmm. won politically. You know, 
it's not as if Scotland in 300 years has had useless lawyers and there was just nobody who ever thought of a wheeze to actually go because Lord Cooper and Sheriff Thompson and others have done it. Right. All I'm saying is this idea that we will be liberated by some legal quiz just ain't going to happen. It's mm. as Thatcher said, it's political. We have to vote for it. If we vote for it, we'll get it. If we don't vote for it, lawyers won't win it for us. Yeah, okay. And I see uh, there's a former lawyer and somebody who still venerates the legal profession. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I know, I, I know, we, we agree, agree on this issue, but the, the issue regarding EFTA and uh, being in the single market. And as I, as as you well as you're well aware, we at the SSRG have been, you know, have, have contacted EFTA, and that uh, you know, and they they're basically the open arms, open door, uh, as long as the. Uh, Scottish government has the capacity to negotiate international treaties and the powers to abide by them. And there's no question that it, it's, it's much, much easier than entering the EU. Uh, I know you agree. I know we agree on that. But if you could speak a little bit more to the differences between EU membership and EFTA membership. Well, EFTA membership allows an independent Scotland to negotiate a trade deal with the rest of the UK. You know, if we join the EU, then we are required to accept the trade deal of the EU. That would mean a hard border. I'm sitting here in Dunbar. I frequently get the train from Berwick. If my wife's about, she'll drop me, you know, or I just get the train at Dunbar and change at Newcastle. I think people in East Lothian and people in the rest of Scotland don't expect to travel to Berwick to have to be delayed at a customs post. They're looking at it scans. That's what's happening at the borders of the channel. Now, if we are part of the EU, then there will be a hard border. We'll be subject to the EU regulations and we won't have a separate deal with the UK. I think here in East Lothian, but it Particular the case, it's a case in all the border counties, and although we are not a border county, it's only Berwickshire that stands between East Lothian and, uh, and you know, the border. It's just a short nip down the A1 or the East Coast Main Line to get there. People are used to being able to go across the border for trade, and I think, you know, Scotland, to be able to persuade our people of the benefits of independence, you have to be a member of EFTA because that allows us back into the single market, which I think people in East Lothian and the rest of Scotland want. But it doesn't force us to have to put up a hard border with the UK when, in fact, what we need to do is to be able to negotiate a trade deal with the rest of the UK. It's exactly the same as we don't want to be in Schengen. We want to be able to have a common travel agreement, as the Irish have, with the UK so that we have minimal disruption at the border. So whether it's me going to get a train at Berwick or, more importantly, folk who are just trading from East Lothian down across the border, you know, into Northumberland are able to do so. So EFTA is the route I think Scotland has to go. That doesn't mean at some future states, once we've, you know, our economy has reconfigured or whatever, that you don't look to go back into the EU. But I think initially what we have to do is to get back into the single market that's desperately needed for our business. But we also have to ensure that we don't damage our business by putting up a hard border when we do have significant levels of trade. You know, don't underestimate our level of trade. It took Ireland many years to move from its main trading partner being the UK to being able now to trade with the United States in particular, which I think is a major trading partner and with the rest of the EU. So EFTA has to be the route. Not only is it best for business, it's best for you know social interaction and politically it's best. Because if I have to go on Dunbar High Street and say to people, you'll have to show your passport, you know, to get trade across the border into Berwick, I think we might find it a harder sell. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I'd like to, in the remaining uh, third or so, um, uh, I'd like to ref just get your prospects on the possible routes to independence. I saw your video for Alba the other day and, you know, we need independence now, which I totally agree with. Uh, but you know, what are the possible routes to it? I know you at you at Alba are you know, doing everything you can, uh, and um, but uh, and you know there are different routes. It's not necessarily simply a Section Thirty order. Maybe it could be a plebiscitary election. You know, in the next Westminster election, maybe that'll happen pretty soon with Boris Johnson. Who knows? Uh, what do you see the um, uh, what, what, what do you what do you see as possible routes towards independence? 
Well, I think the best thing is to call a convention. Call a convention, you know, because we can't be going on like this. It's not simply that the UK is melting down, and indeed, as Alex Hammond and others have said, the British state has never been weaker. Oh, this no, no it's it, it, it never, been, never been in more in disrepute. I mean, they've all, the, the British state has always been fundamentally dishonest, but at least they had power in the past, and they were able to impose their will through the... Um, uh, the, the, the impose their will through their 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 force, but now it's as you say, it's, it's never uh, they, equally the corollary is they won't always be as weak as this. Mm -hmm. Once they get sorted out and they sort out the mess that is Brexit, do they think you know? Does the SNP government not think they're going to come looking for us? You know, they'll turn their fire north of the border once they've sorted out the other issues they've had. That's why we've got to strike and strike now, because yeah. it won't be as easy dealing with another. Why well, if you get somebody, you know, with a, you know, who anybody who comes in, oh, it's hard to think of anybody who could come in who will be viewed as, you know, more of a charlatan than Boris Johnson. So the only way is back up for the, 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 the Tories. That's why we should be moving now. Never mind the fact that a convention should also be there to defend the people from Scotland because, you know, the first thing that flashed up the screen in introduction, Mark, was hope. I think people in Scotland are in danger of losing hope. Once, you know, they see a national insurance hike, once they see the energy prices go through the roof, they're already seeing prices rise on the forecourt or in the shops. Folk are struggling to survive. They're going to say, don't give me your politics, mate. I've had enough of it. I used to vote Labour and they did nothing. And then I voted SNP and they did nothing. And I voted in the last referendum and it never came about. So this is me speaking from 40 years, chap and doors will say, I've had enough. I'm no voting anymore. I'm just going to get on with my life because actually it's really quite hard where I am. And we've got to give people hope. We've got to strike now, you know, and give people an opportunity to get out of this. So a convention should be meeting to say, we don't want any more forced austerity. We want to protect our people from the hardship. Yes, these are tough times for every country post-coronavirus, but we'll make sure that, you know, we'll deal with it in a fair and equitable manner. But the principal way of doing that is to say, if you're not prepared to go and give us a section 30, and they're not going to give us a section 30, the first thing a convention should meet to discuss, and it should include, in my view, people who don't necessarily support independence, but who simply are elected representatives to decide where now for Scotland. And the first point should be, who calls the shots? Is it Westminster or is it Scotland? I think even those who support Devo Max might very well say it's Scotland. So having decided that, Having decided that actually the people of Scotland, through their elected representatives, will be sell, will be sovereign, having described that sovereignty basis and not through the courts, you then move on to the second question. Well, what then are we going to do? And that's where you then move into issues. Is it independence? Is it Devo Max? We can put it to the vote, but you've already decided the people of Scotland call the shots, so we won't be delayed by having to have some Section 30 gold-plated at a time. That suits them, you know, whenever on the never ever. If that isn't implemented, that's when you then look at, you know, moving at a plebiscite election, because that's probably an easier way to do it than a referendum. But I think the first thing is to decide, have a convention of the elected representatives to decide in Scotland who calls and who decides the future of Scotland. Is it a Westminster Parliament where we only have 59 out of 650? Or is it the directly elected democratic representatives of Scotland elected in Parliament at Holyrood, Westminster, and indeed some representatives from the council? That is, I think, the future is where we have to go. Okay. Uh, as you know, uh, we at the SSRG are working towards that and hopefully having some uh, a, a convention in August uh, and with a series of roadshows preceding that, dealing with uh, specific issues about independence, currency, foreign policy, this type of thing. Uh, what do you think? Uh, you know, if uh, what do you think? Are the, you you mentioned the major decisions of you know you know who has sovereignty? Is it you know Scotland or Westminster? What do you think the other major decisions would need to come out of that? And we do have uh, we do have SNP support. We ha we've had you know. I won't name them, of course, but we we have we do have SNP uh, MPs that have participated in our meetings uh, enthusiastically. Uh, and so, what do you think are other decisions that need to be made in uh, in in a convention uh, that that includes among them 
MPs, MSPs, etc., but also has a, a big, uh, a large constituency from uh, from unions, from trade groups, from you know basically all of Scottish civil society. What are the other unions that need to? Uh, sorry, what are the other group? What are the other decisions? Do you feel that need to be made other than who has sovereignty, Westminster or Scotland? Well, that's not for me to. I, I don't think I can set the agenda now for a convention that probably isn't, you know, can't come about until after me. And also, I think you have to have the right entitlement of people to come along. But it seems to me that people are entitled to say, well, you know, when energy prices are rising, what are we doing about it? Why is energy policy decided in Westminster not here? When people are facing, you know, you know, unemployment or indeed other effects upon their terms and conditions of their employment. Why is employment policy decided in Westminster and not here in Scotland? So I would have thought that a convention worth its salt would look to uh, discuss these type of things. But I don't think I can discuss that. I think what you have to do is establish a convention and let the convention then, you know, take its own direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and what do you th what do you think would be an ideal? I mean, uh, a composition. I mean, in terms of the the amount, the number of um, you know, uh, the number of MPs, the number of SNPs, the number of uh, people from civil society. I mean, it, I think there's I think there's a broad view that it shouldn't obviously shouldn't be uniquely uh, politicians. There, but do, do you do you have any view on kind of a percentage or you know how much of civil society should be involved relative to elected officials? Well, I think first and foremost you've got to uh, get the direct elected representatives, which are MPs and MSPs, because they have the they have the mandate. I think you should be looking for delegates from local authorities to represent their council, but the voting delegates are, I think, are, you know, basically MPs and MSPs. After that, you know, you need to let you need to the organ the it be organic. You can't say, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't want to go to a meeting and somebody says, well, this is the agenda and actually these are the outcomes. So I think you've got to allow it to develop. You know, so you need to then make sure that you have Civic Scotland there. Uh, you know, they have to be represented. We've been through this in the convention that was previously done before, you know, and Canon Kenyon Wright and others came out. Sure, sure. So, so it's it's the same but different. So I think you need to allow it to be organic and to develop. But what you need to do is, first of all, get it established. You need to get it called. And then you need to see where it goes. Uh, and then it, you know, then it follows its, uh, then it follows the, 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 the opportunities that come about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. A uh, question from John Paul Warlow. When was the last time you, I'm assuming Kenny, did a speech on independence? And when is the next time you will be doing uh, one? You should be jumping over hoops to get a debate in Westminster. So uh, but basically, uh, could you get a debate in Westminster over independence and would it do any good? Or what, what, no, what are no. your views on that may be possible, but what would the point be? <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I speak about independence frequently, whether on this show, whether on other shows, whether on the streets, uh, you know, it's driving it forward. You know, we're not going to win any vote in Westminster. Westminster's a platform. That's why I've always argued against abstention until, you know, uh, such time as things changes. But I've argued for semi-abstention. That is, we go and we use it, which is why I've used it as a platform to raise the issue, along with Neil, that we raised the issue of Scottish ferries and we got that all running. But the idea that, you know, I might get a debate on independence, yeah, I might. Might be six weeks, it might be six months. But I have to say, I don't think anybody in Dunbar would be holding their breath about what the outcome of it's going to be because the Tories <laughs> wouldn't turn up. You know, it wouldn't be deliberative. It wouldn't be voted upon him or other than perhaps Neil and myself. So, you know, at the end of the day, this battle's going to be won here in Scotland. The battle's not going to be won in Westminster. Westminster's no more, you know, even less than the Scottish judiciary is going to be able to deliver independence. You know, so the voice of independence and making the voice for independence is actually what Neil was doing, you know, at the all under one banner speech where, you know, sadly, you know, and I think it's understandable why the turnout was down. But it's speaking about independence in Scotland that matters. It's using Westminster to focus the issues that are relevant. Because what people want to know about is why is it that our energy prices are going up when we've got oil and gas coming out of our ears? Why is it that our energy prices are going up when we've now got, you know, 25% of the European you know, Union's uh, offshore wind resource? So these are the issues. It's driving it home. You know, the tragedy in Scotland isn't, you know, how bad things are. It's how much better they should be. And we're missing out on that. So... We could debate independence any time Westminster was prepared to allow it, which might be about every, you know, six months or so. But so what? I've been yeah. in the SNP 
until I left to join Alba. And I remember Gordon Wilson to be in, in, you know, Westminster. Our battles here in Scotland and our battles persuading the people of Scotland, not speaking to an empty chamber in Westminster. Yeah. Okay. And uh, given your um, obvious critiques of both the uh, British, uh, the, you know, the UK, you know, uh, system of this, the the, uh, the the situation within the UK government with about uh, Boris Johnson in complete disrepute and w- w- weaker than ever, uh, and also the, um, uh, and also of course the Scottish government, which, uh, as you point out, has, you know, not performed admir- perfectly over over certain issues. Do you see that as kind of a, you know, a, a wedge or a, an opening to uh, become independent and to be and to show that, you know, to, to show what a, a Scottish state uh, could be? Well, I think the remarkable thing that gives me hope is, you know, independence support still registering at 50 <laughs> percent. You know, the, the, the question you have to ask is, why is it only 50 percent? I mean, given that we've got the worst UK government probably since the 19th, if not 18th century, we've got charlatans in charge, life for the people of Scotland is getting worse. You know, we have a Scottish government that, you know, I was having a coffee with a friend and you won't know the background to this, but in the 1960s, you know, Scotland used to have take, participate in football in what they call the Home International Championships. And I get, you know, things about how wonderful the Scottish government's doing in comparison to Westminster on uh, coronavirus. Well, it is in comparison to Westminster, but it's not in comparison to Denmark or in comparison to the Republic of Ireland. Yeah. And exactly the same as we used to be satisfied at football where they beat the English at Wem- Wembley, but we never qualified for the World Cup or the Home International Championship. <laughs> I'm fed up playing in a Home International Championship or a Four Nations. I want to play an international stage. I think Scotland has not done well in coronavirus, despite the First Minister performing far more ably than uh, Boris Johnson. I think the comparison rule is with Mikhail Martin or Leo Varadkar. It's with the Prime Minister of Denmark. It's with the Prime Minister of Norway. And sadly, when we make those comparisons, Scotland has not done particularly well. Mm -hmm. So Scotland's got to raise its eyes above the horizon. Scotland's comparison isn't how we're doing with England. It's how we're doing with Ireland and Norway. And when we compare ourselves with Ireland and Norway, we are doing very, very badly. And yeah. that's why, you know, I've got hope because we're at 50 percent, you know, despite the fact that we've not really tried to galvanize that independent support, nor have we pushed it. And indeed, you could almost argue we'd be doing our best to undermine it. So the fact that we're at 50 percent shows what can be done if we actually get the policies we're right and we get the shoulder to the wheel. And what do you think needs to be done to galvanize that? You, you mentioned a convention, which, of, of course, uh, we at the SSRG agree with. But what, what are some of the more, um, uh, you know, tangible things that the that the Scottish government could do or other or civil society could do to to give hope, as you say, uh, and, and to and to give. I mean, some people say, oh, well, if only Nicola Sturgeon would give a date, that would galvanize it uh, or uh, or other things. But what do you think are the main uh, elements involved in, in really galvanizing and in giving people hope that this is an objective, this can be obtained, how we know how it can be attained, and then they're, 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 therefore we can proceed that way? Well, I think you've got to stop doing what the Scottish government is presently doing. The Scottish government, as I was saying before we came on air, Mark, it seems to me to begin to replicate Martin O'Neill. Martin O'Neill was the Labour MP for uh, Ockels uh, back in the 1990s, who was caught saying that actually the job of the Labour Party was basically to depress the ambitions of the people of Scotland and to, you know, uh, massage down. Uh, it was to say how hard things were and why they couldn't do very much. And we're in danger of seeing that done to us by a government that's support, supposed to support in independence. Things should be so much better. Uh, and that's what we've got to drive on. So you've got to give people direction. You've got to give them light. You can't just say, oh, well, nothing can be done. It's all the fault of Westminster. Well, you're right to point the blame there, but you've got to start moving and give a direction out of it. That's why you have to have the convention to say that we're not putting up with it. You've got to get a bit of fire into people's belly. You've got to start to say there's a better way that we can do. We've got to up our game here, but we've got to get it basically got to get on with it uh, because at the present moment, you know, we're going backwards, not forwards, despite the vote staying at 50%. So, you know, it's leadership and it's a bit of oomph and a bit of direction. Yeah. Okay. And and beyond the convention, uh, I mean, uh, uh, let's see. So, uh, you know, it, 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 
and it, 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 but it's not up simply to the Scottish government to deliver to to have to provide this hope. There, I mean, what are the other avenues that besides uh, you know Nicola Sturgeon all of a sudden saying, okay, we'll have the we'll have a referendum in you know whatever whatever date? Uh, what are the other things that can happen? Do you think that can push this the, the, this uh, process forward? Well, I think it all springs from the convention and it springs from leadership. You know, you bring powers back home. You make sure that people realise. We are the ones, we're in charge of our own destiny. When you know you, you declare that and then you start moving on. I mean, I did have an interesting conversation with an SNP MP once when I was still in, who was asking similar. And then what would happen? And then what would happen with saying, and then what would I don't know, Mark. Yeah. I don't know what the weather's going to be like, you know, a year from now. I don't know what the political situation is going to be like 18 months from now. What I do know is we could actually take charge of our own destiny. Some of that will be going down roads that are uncharted. It will mean taking risks. I can't guarantee that if this follows, then that will happen because it's not as night follows day or A follows B. But what you do is you bring the powers back home. You say that we, the people of Scotland, are sovereign in our own land. We will decide our own destiny. If we decide any vote, whether a plebiscite election or a referendum to stay in the UK, I will accept that because I'm a Democrat. Equally, I think, you know, we have to have the opportunity to put that vote. So what you can't be doing is doing what so many of the SNP are saying is, well, we need to know this and then we need to know what happens and then we need to know what happens after that. Life's not like that. It's not like that in politics. It's not like, I don't know what will happen if I walk out and cross the road. Unfortunately, if I my road, there's actually a zebra crossing. But, you know, things <laughs> happen. So you just sometimes in life, you've just got to give leadership take a risk and get on with it. Yeah, uh, I've been very inspired because uh, I teach American history here in Ren at the University of Wren. And I'm, I'm, I'm focusing very much on the pre-independence period uh, after the French Indian War that ended in uh, 1763 and then the Declaration of Independence in 1776. And so much is so similar. The, uh, the imposing taxes, they put, they, they, they're repressive. They're, you know, they, they start, you know, um, uh, controlling the, you know, making it less democratic, uh, to, you know, uh, you know, putting repression on the different, um, you know, on the different institutions within the within the within the colonies and uh they just had enough at one point and and that was it was much more violent obviously and that but they just said enough is enough we're calling to arms you know in 1775 we're gonna we're gonna um and they declared independence in 1776 and then there was a war that lasted until 1781 and then in 1783 there was the peace treaty of paris but there's so it's it's so similar it rings so similar to to what scotland is going through especially because constitutionally the uh the the colonial charters which governed the you know the 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 the, the british colonies in the united states were written by westminster and so they say you can do this but you can't do that and and oh well uh, you're doing this and we don't like it mm, we're going to pass a law that says you can't do that and it's it's the same thing with scotland and i i, I and i I'll pray to if I was a if I was religious, I would pray to God that there's nothing there's nothing violent about it. But it's it's the same issues, you know. Well, that, is, I mean, a closer example to Scotland's Ireland. I mean, in the 1921 election, you know, when the first time that uh, working people actually had the full franchise, though not for women, it has to shamefully be said. You know, we elected in Scotland the Independent Labour Party. Uh, they were good people: Jamie Maxson, Buchanan. Tom Johnson, but they've ultimately got sucked in down in Westminster and uh, came to naught despite their commitment to a uh, you know home rule for Scotland. Uh, Sinn Fein, that one in Ireland, established the Doyle Aaron. They didn't know when they established the Doyle Aaron in 1922, you know, what the outcome was going to be. We don't have the threat as they had to do in face of a uh, British repression because we have the commitment from Margaret Thatcher and every prime minister since. If the Scots vote for it, the Scots can have it. The Irish actually voted for it. They didn't get it, thanks to Winston Churchill and Lloyd George, but they ultimately got it. So, you know, we just have to establish our own convention, decide that we're going to take our destiny into our own hands and then take it from there. Okay. All right. Uh, but, but I think that, that that ends on a great note. I would just like you to give you the opportunity to say anything additional before we say goodbye to our viewers this evening. But I, th I it was a fantastic conversation. So uh, go ahead. No, I just think, you know, now's the time and now's the hour since uh, Burns night has only recently <laughs> passed. <laughs> this is our chance. If we don't, we will bitterly regret it because the British state is rocking. 
And you know, as we come out of uh, come out of coronavirus and into back into society, we've got to get mobilised and we've got to get active, and we need leadership for that. Yeah. Okay. All right. On that on that positive note, difficult but positive note, uh, I just want to say thank you so much, Kenny, for being with us this evening. And I'm sure that our viewers appreciated what you said. And I I, I see in the comments a, a, a lot of inspi uh, inspired comments, giving people hope, giving people the, you know, the, the volition to go on despite the, you know, bleak times that the many Scots are enduring. So uh, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Thank you. All right. Thank you.